Part One, Chapter One of Anna Karenina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marianne Spiegel. Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. Part One. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Chapter One All happy families resemble one another. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. All was confusion in the house of the Oblonskys. The wife had discovered that her husband was having an intrigue with a French governess who had been in their employ, and she declared that she could not live in the same house with him. This condition of things had lasted now three days, and was causing deep discomfort, not only to the husband and wife, but also to all the members of the family and the domestics. All the members of the family and the domestics felt that there was no sense in their living together, and that in any hotel people meeting casually had more mutual interest than they, the members of the family and the domestics of the house of Oblonsky. The wife did not come out of her own rooms. The husband had not been at home for two days. The children were running over the whole house as if they were crazy. The English maid was angry with the housekeeper, and wrote to a friend begging her to find her a new place. The head cook had departed the evening before just at dinner-time. The kitchen-maid and the coachman demanded their wages. On the third day after the quarrel, Prince Stefan Arkadyevitch Oblonsky, Steva, as he was called in society, awoke at the usual hour, that is to say, about eight o'clock in the morning, not in his wife's chamber, but in his library, on a leather-covered divan. He turned his portly, pampered body on the springs of the divan, as if intending to go to sleep again, and as he did so he threw his arm round the cushion and pressed his cheek to it. But suddenly he sat up and opened his eyes. "'Well, well, how was it?' he mused recalling a dream. Yes, how was it? Yes, Alaban was giving a dinner at Darmstadt. No, not at Darmstadt, but it was something American. Yes, but that Darmstadt was in America. Yes, Alaban was giving a dinner on glass tables. Yes, and the tables sang Il Mio Tosoro. No, not Il Mio Tosoro, but something better and some little water-bottles. They were women, said he, continuing his recollections. Prince Stefan's eyes flashed gaily, and he smiled as he said to himself, Yes, it was very good, very good. There was something extremely elegant about it, but you can't tell it in words, and when you are awake you can't express the reality even in thought. Then, as he noticed a ray of sunlight which came in at the side of one of the heavy window-curtains, he gaily set his feet down from the divan, found his gilt Morocco slippers, they had been embroidered for him by his wife the year before as a birthday present, and, according to an old custom which he kept up for nine years, he, without rising, stretched out his hand to the place where in his chamber hung his dressing-gown, and then he suddenly remembered how and why he had been sleeping, not in his wife's chamber, but in the library. The smile vanished from his face, and he frowned. Ugh, oh, ugh, oh, oh, he groaned, as he recollected everything that had occurred, and before his mind arose once more all the details of the quarrel with his wife, all the hopelessness of his situation, and most lamentable of all, his own fault. No, she will not, and she cannot forgive me, and what is the worst of it, t'was my own fault, my own fault, and yet I am not to blame. In that lies all the tragedy of it, he said to himself. Ugh, 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 he kept muttering in his despair, as though over the exceedingly unpleasant consequences that would result to him from this quarrel. The most disagreeable moment was at the very first, when, as he came home from the theatre, happy and self-satisfied, bringing a monstrous pair for his wife, he did not find her in the sitting-room, nor, to his surprise, was she in the library, and at last he saw her in her chamber, holding the fatal, all-revealing letter in her hand. She, Dolly, that forever busy and fussy and foolish creature as he always considered her, 
was sitting motionless with the note in her hand, and looked at him with an expression of terror, despair, and wrath. "'What is this? This!' she demanded, pointing to the note. And as often happens, Stepan's torment at this recollection was caused less by the fact itself than by the answer which he gave to those words of his wife. His experience at that moment was the same as other people have had when unexpectedly detected in some shameful deed. He was unable to prepare his face for the situation caused by his wife's discovery of his sin. Instead of getting offended, denying it, justifying himself, asking forgiveness, or even showing indifference, anything would have been better than what he really did. In spite of himself, by a reflex action of the brain, as Stefan Arkadyevitch explained it, for he loved physiology. Absolutely in spite of himself, he suddenly smiled with his ordinary, good-humoured, and therefore stupid smile. He could not forgive himself for that stupid smile. When Dolly saw that smile, she trembled as with physical pain, poured forth a torrent of bitter words, quite in accordance with her natural temper, and fled from the room. Since that time she had not been willing to see her husband. That stupid smile caused the whole trouble, thought Stefan Arkadyevitch. But what is to be done about it? What is to be done? he asked himself in despair, and found no answer. End of chapter 1 Part 1, Chapter 2 of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne Spiegel. Stefan Arkadyevitch was a sincere man, as far as he himself was concerned. He could not practice self-deception and persuade himself that he repented of his behavior. He could not, as yet, feel sorry that he, a handsome and susceptible man of four and thirty, was not now in love with his wife, the mother of his five living and two buried children, though she was only a year his junior. He regretted only that he had not succeeded in hiding it better from her, but he felt the whole weight of his situation, and pitied his wife, his children, and himself. Possibly he would have had better success in hiding his peccadilloes from his wife had he realized that this knowledge would have had such an effect upon her. He had never before thought clearly of this question, but he had a dim idea that his wife had long been aware that he was not faithful to her, and looked at it through her fingers. As she had lost her freshness, was beginning to look old, was no longer pretty, and far from distinguished, and entirely commonplace, though she was an excellent mother of a family, he had thought that she would allow her innate sense of justice to plead for him, but it had proved to be quite the contrary. "'Ugh! How wretched! Ay, 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 how wretched!' said Prince Stefan to himself over and over, and could not find any way out of the difficulty." and how well everything was going until this happened. How delightfully we lived! She was content, happy with the children. I never interfered with her in any way. I allowed her to do as she pleased with the children and the household. To be sure it was bad that she had been the governess in our own house. That was bad. There is something trivial and common in playing the gallant to one's own governess. But what a governess! He vividly recalled Mademoiselle Laurelin's black, roguish eyes and her smile. But then, while she was here in the house with us, I did not permit myself any liberties. And the worst of all is that she is all ready. And this must needs happen just to spite me. Ay, ay, ay. But what? What is to be done? There was no answer except that common answer which life gives to all the most complicated and unsolvable questions— this answer. You must live according to circumstances. In other words, forget yourself. But as you cannot forget yourself in sleep, at least till night, as you cannot return to that music which the water-bottle woman sang, therefore you must forget yourself in the dream of life. We shall see by and by, said Stefan Arkadyevitch to himself, and rising he put on his grey dressing-gown with blue silk lining, tied the tassels into a knot, and took a full breath into his ample lungs. Then, with his usual firm step, his legs spread somewhat apart, and easily bearing the solid weight of his body, 
he went over to the window, lifted the curtain, and loudly rang the bell. It was instantly answered by his old friend and valet, Matva, who came in bringing his clothes, boots, and a telegram. Behind Matva came the barber with the shaving utensils. "'Are there any papers from the courthouse?' asked Stefan Arkadyevitch, taking the telegram and taking his seat in front of the mirror. "'On the breakfast-table,' replied Matva, looking inquiringly and with sympathy at his master, and after an instant's pause, added with a sly smile, "'They have come from the boss of the livery-stable.' Stefan Arkadyevitch made no reply, and only looked at Matva in the mirror. By the look which they interchanged, it could be seen how they understood each other. The look of Stefan Arkadyevitch seemed to ask, "'Why did you say that? Don't you know?' Matva thrust his hands in his jacket-pockets, kicked out his leg, and silently, good-naturedly, almost smiling, looked back to his master. "'I ordered them to come on Sunday, until then that you and I should not be annoyed without reason.' said he, with a phrase evidently ready on his tongue. Stefan Arkadyevitch perceived that Matva wanted to make some jesting reply and attract attention to himself. Tearing open the telegram, he read it, using his wits to make out the words that were as usual blindly written, and his face brightened. Matva, Sister Anna Arkadyevna will be here tomorrow, said he, staying for a moment the plump, gleaming hand of his barber, who was making a pink path through his long, curly whiskers. "'Thank God!' cried Matva, showing by this exclamation that he understood as well as his master the significance of this arrival, that it meant that Anna Arkadyevna, Prince Stefan's loving sister, might effect a reconciliation between husband and wife. "'Alone or with her husband?' asked Matva. Stefan Arkadyevitch could not speak, as the barber was engaged on his upper lip, but he lifted one finger. Matva nodded his head toward the mirror. Alone. Get her room ready. Report to Darya Alexandrovna, and let her decide. To Darya Alexandrovna, repeated Matva, rather skeptically. Yes, report to her, and here, take the telegram, give it to her, and do as she says. You want to try an experiment, was the thought in Matva's mind, but he only said, I will obey. By this time Stefan Arkadyevitch had finished his bath and his toilet, and was just putting on his clothes, when Matva, stepping slowly with squeaking boots, and with the telegram in his hand, returned to the room. The barber was no longer there. Darya Alexandrovna bade me tell you she is going away. Do just as he, as you, please about it said Matva, with a smile lurking in his eyes. Thrusting his hands into his pockets, and bending his head to one side, he looked at his master. Stepan Arkadyevitch was silent. Then a good-humoured and rather pitiful smile lighted up his handsome face. "'Well, Matva,' he said, shaking his head. "'It is nothing, sir. She will come to her senses,' answered Matva. "'Will come to her senses?' "'Sure she will.' "'Do you think so?' "'Who is there?' asked Stefan Arkadyevitch, hearing the rustle of a woman's dress behind the door. "'It's me,' said a powerful and pleasant female voice, and in the doorway appeared the severe and pimply face of Matryona Filimonovna, the nurse. "'Well, what is it, Matryosha?' asked Stefan Arkadyevitch, going to meet her at the door. Notwithstanding the fact that Stefan Arkadyevitch was entirely in the wrong as regarded his wife, and he himself acknowledged it, still almost every one in the house, even the old nurse, Darya Alexandrovna's chief friend, was on his side. "'Well, what?' he asked gloomily. "'You go down, sir. Ask her forgiveness, just once. Perhaps the Lord will bring it out right. She is tormenting herself grievously, and it is pitiful to see her. And everything in the house is going criss-cross. The children, sir, you must have pity on them.' Ask her forgiveness, sir. What is to be done? No gains without pains. But you see, she won't accept an apology. But you do your part. God is merciful, sir. Pray to God. God is merciful. Very well, then. Come on, said Stepan Arkadyevitch, suddenly turning red in the face. Very well. Let me have my clothes, said he, turning to Matva, and resolutely throwing off his dressing-gown. Motva had everything all ready for him, and stood blowing off something invisible from the shirt, stiff as a horse-collar, 
and with evident satisfaction he put it over his master's well-groomed body. End of chapter 2 Part 1, Chapter 3 of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne Spiegel Having dressed, Stefan Arkadyevitch sprinkled himself with perfume, straightened the sleeves of his shirt, according to his usual routine, put into his various pockets cigarettes, his letter-case, matches, his watch with its double chain and locket, and, shaking out his handkerchief, feeling clean, well-perfumed, healthy, and physically happy in spite of his unhappiness, he went out somewhat unsteadily into the dining-room, where his coffee was already waiting for him, and next the coffee his letters and the papers from the courthouse. He read the letters. One was very disagreeable, from a merchant who was negotiating for the purchase of a forest on his wife's estate. It was necessary to sell this forest, but now nothing could be done about it until a reconciliation was effected with his wife. Most unpleasant it was to think that his pecuniary interests in this approaching transaction were complicated with his reconciliation to his wife, and the thought that he might be influenced by this interest, that his desire for a reconciliation with his wife was on account of the sale of the forest, this thought mortified him. Having finished his letters, Stefan Arkadyevitch took up the papers from the courthouse, rapidly turned over the leaves of two deeds, made several notes with a big pencil, and then pushing them away, took his coffee. While he was drinking, he opened a morning journal still damp, and began to read. Stefan Arkadyevitch subscribed to a liberal paper, and read it. It was not extreme in its views, but advocated those principles which the majority held. And though he was not really interested in science, or art, or politics, he strongly adhered to such views on all these subjects as the majority, including his paper, advocated, and he changed them only when the majority changed them, or more correctly, he did not change them, but they themselves imperceptibly changed in him. Stefan Arkadyevitch never chose principles or opinions, but these principles and opinions came to him, just as he never chose the shape of a hat or coat, but took those that others wore. And, living as he did in fashionable society, through the necessity of some mental activity, developing generally in a man's best years, it was as indispensable for him to have views as to have a hat. If there was any reason why he preferred liberal views rather than the conservative direction which many of his circle followed, it was not because he found a liberal tendency more rational, but because he found it better suited to his mode of life. The liberal party declared that everything in Russia was wretched, and the fact was that Stefan Arkadyevitch had a good many debts and was decidedly short of money. The Liberal Party said that marriage was a defunct institution, and that it needed to be remodeled, and in fact domestic life afforded Stefan Arkadyevitch very little pleasure, and compelled him to lie, and to pretend what was contrary to his nature. The Liberal Party said, or rather took it for granted, that religion is only a curb on the barbarous portion of the community, and in fact Stefan Arkadyevitch could not bear the shortest prayer without pain in his knees, and he could not comprehend the necessity of all these awful and high-sounding words about the other world when it was so pleasant to live in this. Moreover, Stefan Arkadyevitch, who liked a merry jest, was sometimes fond of scandalizing a quiet man by saying that any one who was proud of his origin ought not to stop at Rurik and deny his earliest ancestor, the monkey. Thus the liberal tendency had become a habit with Stefan Arkadyevitch, and he liked his paper, just as he liked his cigar after dinner, because of the slight haziness which it caused in his brain. He was now reading the leading editorial, which proved that in our day a cry is raised, without reason, over the danger that radicalism may swallow up all the conservative elements, and that government ought to take measures to crush the hydra of revolution, and that, on the contrary, according to our opinion, the danger lies not in this imaginary hydra of revolution, but in the inertia of traditions which block progress, and so on. He read through another article on finance which made mention of Breton and Mill, 
and drop some sharp hints for the ministry. With his peculiar quickness of comprehension he appreciated each point, from whom and against whom and on what occasion it was directed, and this as usual afforded him some amusement, but his satisfaction was poisoned by the remembrance of Matriona's advice and on the unfortunate state of his domestic affairs. He read also that Count von Buist was reported to have gone to Wiesbaden, and that there was to be no more grey hair. He read about the sale of a light carriage and a young woman's advertisement for a place, but these items did not afford him quiet, ironical satisfaction, as usual. Having finished his paper, his second cup of coffee, and a buttered roll, he stood up, shook the crumbs of the roll from his waistcoat, and, filling his broad chest, smiled joyfully, not because there was anything extraordinarily pleasant in his mind, but the joyful smile was caused by good digestion. But this joyful smile immediately brought back the memory of everything, and he sank into thought. The voices of two children, Stefan Arkadyevitch knew they were Grisha, his youngest boy, and Tanya, his eldest daughter, were now heard behind the door. They were dragging something and upset it. "'I told you not to put the passengers on top,' cried the little girl in English. "'Now pick them up!' "'Everything is in confusion,' said Stefan Arkadyevitch to himself. "'Now here the children are, running wild.' And going to the door he called them. They dropped the little box which served them for a railway train, and ran to their father. The little girl, her father's favorite, ran in boldly, threw her arms around his neck, and laughingly hugged him, enjoying as usual the odor which exhaled from his whiskers. Then, kissing his face, reddened by his bending position, and beaming with tenderness, the little girl unclasped her hands, and wanted to run away again, but her father held her back. "'What is Mama doing?' he asked, caressing his daughter's smooth, soft neck. "'How are you?' he added, smiling at the boy who stood saluting him. He acknowledged he had less love for the little boy, yet he tried to be impartial. But the boy felt the difference, and did not smile back in reply to his father's chilling smile. "'Mama, she's up,' answered the little girl. Stefan Arkadyevitch sighed. "'Of course she has spent another sleepless night,' he said to himself. "'Well, is she cheerful? The little girl knew that there was trouble between her father and her mother, and that her mother could not be cheerful, and that her father ought to know it, and that he was dissembling when he questioned her so lightly. And she blushed for her father. He instantly perceived it, and also turned red. I don't know, she said. She told me that we were not to have lessons this morning, but were to go with Miss Hull over to grandmother's. Well, then, run along. Trenchurachka Moya. Oh, yes, wait, he said, still detaining her and smoothing her delicate little hand. He took down from the mantelpiece a box of candy which he had placed there the day before, and gave her two pieces, selecting her favorite chocolate and vanilla. For Grisha? she asked, pointing to the chocolate. Yes, yes, and still smoothing her soft shoulder, he kissed her on the neck and hair and let her go. The carriage is at the door, said Matva, and he added, a woman is here, a petitioner. Has she been here long? demanded Stefan Arkadyevitch. Half an hour. How many times have you been told to announce visitors instantly? I had to get your coffee ready, replied Matva, in his kind, rough voice, at which it was impossible to take offence. Well, show her in quick, said Oblonsky, frowning with annoyance. The petitioner, the wife of Captain Kalanin, asked some impossible and nonsensical favour, but Stefan Arkadyevitch, according to his custom, gave her a comfortable seat, listened to her story without interrupting, and then gave her cheerful advice to whom and how to make her application, and in lively and eloquent style wrote, in his big, scrawling, but handsome and legible hand, a note to the person who might aid her. Having dismissed the captain's wife, Stefan Arkadyevitch took his hat and stood for a moment, trying to remember whether he had forgotten anything— he seemed to have forgotten nothing except what he wanted to forget, his wife. Ah, yes. He dropped his head, and a gloomy expression came over his handsome face. To go or not to go, he said to himself, and an inner voice told him that it was not advisable to go, that there was no way out of it except through deception, that to straighten, to smooth out their relations was impossible, because it was impossible to make her attractive and lovable again, or to make him an old man insensible to passion. 
Nothing but deception and lying could come of it, and deception and lying were opposed to his nature. But it must be done sometime. It can't remain so always, said he, striving to gain courage. He straightened himself, took out a cigarette, lighted it, puffed at it two or three times, threw it into a mother-of-pearl lined ashtray, went with quick steps through the sitting-room, and opened the door into his wife's sleeping-room. End of chapter 3 Part 1, Chapter 4 of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle The Slippervox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne Spiegel Darya Alexandrovna, surrounded by all sorts of things thrown in confusion about the room, was standing before an open chiffonier, from which she was removing the contents. She had on a dressing sack, and the thin braids of her once luxuriant and beautiful hair were pinned back. Her face was thin and sunken, and her big eyes, protruding from her pale, worn face, had an expression of terror. When she heard her husband's steps, she stopped in her work and, gazing at the door, vainly tried to give her face a stern and forbidding expression. She was conscious that she feared him and that she dreaded the coming interview. She was in the act of doing what she had attempted to do a dozen times during those three days, gathering up her own effects and those of her children to carry to her mother's house, and again she could not bring herself to do it. Yet now, as before, she said to herself that things could not remain as they were, that she must take some measure to punish him, to put him to shame, to have some revenge on him, if only for a small part of the anguish that he had caused her. She still kept saying that she should leave him, but she felt that it was impossible. It was impossible because she could not cease to consider him her husband and to love him. Moreover, she confessed that if here in her own home she had barely succeeded in looking after her five children, it would be far worse where she was going with them. In the course of these three days the youngest child had been made ill by eating some poor soup, and the rest had been obliged to go almost dinnerless the night before. She felt that it was impossible to leave, yet for the sake of deceiving herself she was collecting her things and pretending that she was going. When she saw her husband, she thrust her hands into a drawer of the chiffonier, as if trying to find something, and looked at him only when he came up close to her. But her face, to which she had intended to give a stern and resolute expression, showed her confusion and anguish of mind. "'Dolly,' said he, in a gentle, subdued voice. He hung his head and tried to assume a humble and submissive mien, but nevertheless he was radiant with fresh life and health. She gave him a quick glance which took in his whole figure from head to foot, radiant with life and health. "'Yes, he is happy and contented,' she said to herself, "'but I—' and this good nature which makes everybody like him so well, and praise him, is revolting to me. I hate this good nature of his. Her mouth grew firm, and the muscles of her right cheek contracted. She looked pale and nervous. "'What do you want?' she demanded, in a quick, unnatural tone. "'Dolly,' he repeated, with a quaver in his voice. "'Anna is coming to-day. "'Well?' "'What is that to me? I cannot receive her,' she cried. "'Still, it must be done, Dolly.' "'Go away! Go away! Go away!' she cried, without looking at him as if her words were torn from her by physical agony. Stefan Arkadyevitch might be calm enough as his thoughts turned to his wife. He might have some hope that it would all straighten itself out according to Matva's prediction— and he might be able tranquilly to read his morning paper and drink his coffee. But when he saw her tortured, suffering face, when he heard that resigned and hopeless tone of her voice, he breathed hard, something rose in his throat, and his eyes filled with tears. "'My God! What have I done? For God's sake! See—' He could not say another word for the sobs that choked him, she shut the drawer violently and looked at him. "'Dolly, what can I say? Only one thing. Forgive me. Just think. 
Cannot nine years of my life pay for a single moment? A moment? She let her eyes fall, and listened to what he was going to say, as if beseeching him in some way to persuade her of his innocence. A single moment of temptation, he ended, and was going to continue, but at that word Dolly's lips again closed tight, as if from physical pain, and again the muscles of her right cheek contracted. "'Go away! Go away from here!' she cried still more impetuously. "'And don't speak to me of your temptations and your wretched conduct!' She attempted to leave the room, but she almost fell, and was obliged to lean upon a chair for support. Oblonsky's face grew melancholy, his lips trembled, and his eyes filled with tears. "'Dolly!' said he, almost sobbing. "'For God's sake, think of the children. They are not to blame. I am the one to blame. Punish me. Tell me how I can atone for my fault. I am ready to do anything. I am guilty. No words can tell how guilty I am. But, Dolly, forgive me.' She sat down. He heard her quick, hard breathing, and his soul was filled with pity for her. She tried several times to speak, but could not utter a word. He waited. "'You think of the children, because you like to play with them. But I think of them, too, and I know what they have lost,' said she, repeating one of the phrases that during the last three days she had many times repeated to herself. She had used the familiar tui, thou, and he looked at her with gratitude, and made a movement as if to take her hand, but she turned away from him with abhorrence. I have consideration for my children, and therefore I would do all in the world to save them, but I do not myself know how I can best save them, by taking them from their father, or by leaving them with a father who is a libertine. Yes, a libertine. Now tell me after this. This has happened. Can we live together? Is it possible? Tell me, is it possible? She demanded, raising her voice. When my husband, the father of my children, has a love affair with their governess. But what is to be done about it? What is to be done? said he, interrupting with broken voice, not knowing what he said, and letting his head sink lower and lower. You are revolting to me. You are insulting, she cried with increasing anger. Your tears are water. You never loved me. You have no heart, no honor. You are abominable, revolting, and henceforth you are a stranger to me. Yes, a perfect stranger. And she repeated with spiteful anger this word stranger, which was so terrible in her own ears. He looked at her, and the anger expressed in her face alarmed and surprised him. He had no realizing sense that his pity exasperated his wife. He saw that he felt sympathy for her, but not love. No, she hates me. She will not forgive me he said to himself. "'This is terrible, terrible!' he cried. At this moment one of the children in the next room, having apparently had a fall, began to cry. Darya Alexandrovna listened, and her face suddenly softened. She seemed to collect her thoughts for a few seconds, as if she did not know where she was and what was happening to her. Then, quickly rising, she hastened to the door. "'At any rate, she loves my child,' thought Oblonsky, who had noticed the change in her face as she heard the little one's cry. "'My child! How then can she hate me?' "'Dolly, just one word more,' he said, following her. "'If you follow me, I will call the domestics, the children. Let them all know that you are infamous. I leave you this very day, and you may live here with your paramour.' And she went out and slammed the door. Stefan Arkadyevitch sighed, wiped his face, and softly left the room. Matva says this can be settled, but how? I don't see the possibility. Oh, oh, how terrible! And how foolishly she shrieked, said he to himself, as he recalled her cry and the words infamous and paramour. Perhaps the chambermaids heard her. Horribly foolish. Horribly. Stefan Arkadyevitch stood by himself a few seconds, rubbed his eyes, sighed, and then, throwing out his chest, left the room. It was Friday, and in the dining-room the German clockmaker was winding the clock. Stefan Arkadyevitch remembered a joke that he had made about this punctilious German clockmaker, to the effect that 
he must have been wound up himself for a lifetime for the purpose of winding clocks. And he smiled. Stefan Arkadyevitch loved a good joke. Perhaps it will straighten itself out. That's a good little phrase. Straighten itself out, he thought. I must tell that. Matva, he shouted, and when the old servant appeared, he said, Have Marya put the best room in order for Anna Arkadyevna? Very well. Stefan Arkadyevitch took his fur coat and started down the steps. Shall you dine at home? asked Matva, as he escorted him down. That depends. Here, take this if you need to spend anything, said he, taking out a bill of ten roubles from his pocket-book. That will be enough. Whether it is enough or not, it will have to do, said Matva, as he shut the carriage door and went up the steps. Meantime Darya Alexandrovna, having pacified the child, and knowing by the sound of the carriage that he was gone, came back to her room. This was her sole refuge from the domestic troubles that besieged her as soon as she went out. Even during the short time that she had been in the nursery, the English maid and Matryona Filimonovna asked her all sorts of questions demanding immediate attention, questions which she alone could answer. What clothes should they put on the children for their walk, and should they give them milk, should they send for another cook? "'Ugh! Oh, leave me alone! Leave me alone!' she cried, and, hastening back to the chamber, she sat down in the place where she had been talking with her husband. Then, clasping her thin hands, on whose fingers the rings would scarcely stay, she reviewed the whole conversation. "'He has gone, but has he broken with her?' she asked herself. "'Does he still continue to see her? Why didn't I ask him? No, no, we cannot live together, even if we continue to live in the same house. We are only strangers, strangers for ever.' she repeated, with a strong emphasis on the word that hurt her so cruelly. How I loved him! And even now, do I not love him? Do I not love him even more than before? That is the most terrible thing, she was beginning to say, but she did not finish out her thought, because Matryona Filimonovna put her head in at the door. Give orders to send for my brother, said she. He will get dinner." If you don't, it will be like yesterday, when the children did not have anything to eat for six hours. Very good. I will come and give the order. Have you sent for some fresh milk? And Darya Alexandrovna entered into her daily tasks, and in them forgot her sorrow for the time being. End of chapter 4 Part 1, Chapter 5 of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne Spiegel. Stefan Arkadyevitch had done well at school, by reason of his excellent natural gifts, but he was lazy and mischievous, and consequently had been at the foot of his class. But, in spite of his irregular habits, his low rank in the service, and his youth, he, nevertheless, held an important salaried position as Nachalnik or president of one of the courts in Moscow. This place he had secured through the good offices of his sister Anna's husband, Alexey Alexandrovitch Karinin, who occupied one of the most influential positions in the ministry of which he was a member. But even if Karinin had not been able to get this place for his brother-in-law, a hundred other people, brothers, sisters, cousins, second cousins, uncles, aunts, would have got it for Steva Oblonsky, or some place as good, together with the six thousand roubles salary which he needed for his establishment, his affairs being somewhat out of order in spite of his wife's considerable fortune. Half the people of Moscow and St. Petersburg were relatives or friends of Stefan Arkadyevitch. He was born into the society of the rich and powerful of this world. A third of the older officials, attached to the court and in the government employ, had been friends of his father, and had known him from the time when he wore petticoats. A second third addressed him familiarly in the second person singular. The others were hail fellows well met. He had, therefore, as his friends, all those whose function it is to dispense earthly blessings in the shape of places, leases, concessions, and the like, and who could not neglect their own. And so Oblonsky had no special difficulty in obtaining an excellent place. All he had to do was not to shirk, not to be jealous, not to be quarrelsome, not to be thin-skinned, and he never gave way to these faults, because of his natural good temper. 
it would have seemed ridiculous to him if he had been told that he could not have any salary place that he wanted because it did not seem to him that he demanded anything extraordinary he asked only for what his companions were obtaining and he felt that he was as capable as any of them of performing the duties of such a position stepan arkadyevitch was liked by every one for his good and amiable character and his unimpeachable honesty there was moreover something in his brilliant and attractive personality in his bright sparkling eyes his black brows his hair his vivid colouring which exercised a strong physical influence as a friendliness and gaiety on those who came in touch with him ah stiva oblonsky here he is people would generally say with a smile of pleasure even if it happened that the results of meeting him were not particularly gratifying nevertheless people were just as glad to meet him the second day and the third after filling for three years the office of nachalnik of one of the chief judiciary positions in moscow stepan arkadyevitch had gained not only the friendship but also the respect of his colleagues both those above and those below him in station as well as of all who had dealings with him the principal qualities that had gained him this universal esteem were first his extreme indulgence for people and this was founded on his knowledge of his own weaknesses secondly his absolute liberality which was not the liberalism which he read about in the newspapers but that which was in his blood and caused him to be agreeable to every one and in whatever station in life and thirdly and principally his perfect indifference to the business which he transacted so that he never lost his temper and therefore never made mistakes as soon as he reached his tribunal stepan arkadyevitch escorted by the solemn swiss who bore his portfolio went to his little private office put on his uniform and proceeded to the court-room the clerks and other employees all stood up bowing eagerly and respectfully stepan arkadyevitch as usual hastened to his place shook hands with his colleagues and took his seat he got off some pleasantry and made some remarks suitable to the occasion and then opened the session no one better than he understood how far to go within the limits of freedom frankness and that official dignity which is so useful in the expression of official business a clerk came with papers and with the free and yet respectful air common to all who surrounded stepan arkadyevitch spoke in the familiarly liberal tone which stepan arkadyevitch had introduced we have at last succeeded in obtaining reports to the government of penza here they are if you care to so we have them at last said stepan arkadyevitch touching the document with his finger now then gentlemen and the proceedings began if they knew he said to himself as he bent his head with an air of importance while the report was read how much their president only half an hour since looked like a naughty schoolboy and a gleam of amusement came into his eyes as he listened to the report the session generally lasted till two o'clock without interruption and was followed by recess and luncheon the clock had not yet struck two when the great glass doors of the courtroom were suddenly thrown open and some one entered all the members glad of any diversion looked round from where they sat under the emperor's portrait and behind the tsertsalo or proclamation table but the doorkeeper instantly ejected the intruder and shut the door on him after the business was read through stepan arkadyevitch arose stretched himself and in spite of sacrifice to the liberalism of the time took out his cigarette while still in the courtroom and then passed into his private office two of his colleagues the aged veteran Nikitin, and the chamberlain Grinovitch, followed him. "'There'll be time enough to finish after luncheon,' said Oblonsky. "'How we are rushing through with it,' replied Nikitin. "'This Feyman must be a precious rascal,' said Grinovitch, alluding to one of the characters in the affair which they had been investigating. Stefan Arkadyevitch knitted his brows at Grinovitch's words, as if to signify that it was not the right thing to form snap judgments, and he made no reply." "'Who was it came into the courtroom?' he asked of the doorkeeper. "'Someone who entered without permission, Your Excellency, while my back was turned. He asked to see you. I said, when the court adjourns, then—' "'Where is he?' Uh, "'Probably in the vestibule. He was there just now. Ah, there he is,' said the doorkeeper, pointing to a solidly built, broad-shouldered man with a curly beard who, without taking off his sheepskin cap, was lightly and quickly running up the well-worn steps of the stone staircase.' 
a lean chinovnik on his way down with a portfolio under his arm stopped to look with some indignation at the newcomer's feet and turned to oblonsky with a glance of inquiry stepan arkadyevitch stood at the top of the staircase and his bright good-natured face set off by the embroidered collar of his uniform was still more radiant when he recognized the visitor here he is Levin at last he cried with a friendly ironical smile as he looked at his approaching friend what you got tired of waiting for me and have come to find me in this den he went on to say not satisfied with pressing his hand but kissing him affectionately have you been in town long i just got here and was in a hurry to see you said levin looking about him timidly and at the same time with a fierce and anxious expression well come into my office said stepan arkadyevitch who was aware of his visitor's egotistic sensitiveness and taking him by the hand led him along as if he were conducting him through manifold dangers stepan arkadyevitch addressed almost all his acquaintances with the familiar thou old men of threescore young men of twenty actors and ministers merchants and generals so that they were very many of these familiarly addressed acquaintances from both extremes of the social scale and they would have been astonished to know that through oblonsky they had something in common he thus addressed all with whom he had drunk champagne and he had drunk champagne with every one and so when in the presence of his subordinates he met with any of his shameful intimates as he jestingly called some of his acquaintances his characteristic tact was sufficient to diminish the disagreeable impressions that they might have levin was not one of his shameful intimates but oblonsky instinctively felt that levin might think he would not like to make a display of their intimacy before his subordinates and so he hastened to take him into his private office levin was about the same age as oblonsky and their intimacy was not based on champagne alone levin was a friend and companion from early boyhood in spite of the difference in their characters and their tastes they were fond of each other as friends are who have grown up together and yet as often happens among men who have chosen different spheres of activity each while approving the work of the other really despised it each believed his own mode of life to be the only rational way of living while that led by his friend was only an illusion at the sight of levin oblonsky could not repress a slight ironical smile how many times had he seen him in moscow just in from the country where he had been doing something though oblonsky did not know exactly what and scarcely took any interest in it levin always came to moscow anxious hurried a trifle annoyed and vexed because he was annoyed and generally bringing with him entirely new and unexpected views of things stepan arkadyevitch laughed at this and yet liked it in somewhat the same way levin despised the city mode of his friend's life and his official employment which he considered trifling and made sport of it but the difference between them lay in this that oblonsky doing what everyone else was doing laughed self-confidently and good-naturedly while levin because he was not assured in his own mind sometimes lost his temper we have been expecting you for some time said stepan arkadyevitch as he entered his office and let go his friend's hand to show that the danger was past i am very very glad to see you he continued how goes it how are you when did you come levin was silent and looked at the unknown faces of oblonsky's two colleagues and especially at the elegant grenovitch's hand with its long white fingers and their long yellow and pointed nails and his cuffs with their huge gleaming cuff buttons it was evident that his hands absorbed all of his attention and allowed him to think of nothing else oblonsky instantly noticed this and smiled ah yes he said allow me to make you acquainted with my colleagues Philip Ivanovitch Nikitin, Mikhail Stanislavitch Grinovitch, then turning to Levin, a landed proprietor, a rising man, a member of the Zemspo, and a gymnast who can lift two hundred pounds with one hand, a raiser of cattle, and huntsman, and my friend, Konstantin Dmitrievich Levin, the brother of Sergei Ivanovitch Kosnyoshev. Very happy, said the little old man. I have the honor of knowing your brother, Sergei Ivanovitch said Grinovitch, extending his delicate hand with its long nails. Levin frowned. He coldly shook hands and turned to Oblonsky. Although he had much respect for his half-brother, a writer universally known in Russia, it was none the less unpleasant for him to be addressed not as Konstantin Levin, 
but as the brother of the famous Kosnuyshev. No, I am no longer a worker in the Zemspo. I have quarrelled with everybody, and I don't go to the assemblies," said he to Oblonsky. This is a sudden change," said Stepan Arkadyevitch with a smile. But how? Why? It is a long story, and I will tell it some other time," replied Levin. But he nevertheless went on to say, "To make a long story short, I was convinced that no action amounts to anything, or can amount to anything, in our provincial assemblies." He spoke as if someone had insulted him. On the one hand, they try to play parliament, and I am not young enough and not old enough to amuse myself with toys. And on the other hand, he hesitated. This serves the district ring to make a little money. There used to be guardianships, judgments, but now they have the zemspo, not in the way of bribes, but in the way of unearned salaries. He spoke hotly, as if someone present had attacked his views. Aha! Here you are, I see, in a new phrase, on the conservative side," said Stepan Arkadyevitch. "Well, we'll speak about this by and by." "Yes, by and by. But I want to see you particularly," said Levin, looking with disgust at Grinevitch's hand. Stepan Arkadyevitch smiled imperceptibly. "Didn't you say that you would never again put on European clothes?" he asked, examining his friend's new suit, evidently made by a French tailor. "Indeed, I see. Tis a new phase." Levin suddenly grew red, not as grown men grow red, without perceiving it, but as boys blush, conscious that they are ridiculous by reason of their bashfulness, and therefore ashamed and made to turn still redder till the tears almost come. It gave his intelligent, manly face such a strange appearance that Oblonsky turned away and refrained from looking at him. "'But where can we meet? You see it is very, very necessary for me to have a talk with you,' said Levin. Oblonsky seemed to reflect. How is this? We will go and have luncheon at Gurin's, and we can talk there. At three o'clock I shall be free. No, answered Levin, after a moment's thought. I have got to take a drive. Well, then, let us dine together. Dine? But I have nothing very particular to say. Only two words. To ask a question. Afterward we can gossip. In that case, speak your two words now. We will chat while we are at dinner. These two words are, however, it is nothing very important. His face suddenly assumed a hard expression, due to his efforts in conquering his timidity. What are the Shcherbatskys doing? Just as they used to? Stepan Arkadyevitch, who had long known that Levin was in love with his sister-in-law Kitty, almost perceptibly smiled, and his eyes flashed gaily. You said two words, but I cannot answer in two words, because— Excuse me a moment— the secretary came in at this juncture with his familiar but respectful bearing, and with that modest assumption characteristic of all secretaries that he knew more about business than his superior. He brought some papers to Oblonsky, and under the form of a question he attempted to explain some difficulty. Without waiting to hear the end of the explanation, Stefan Arkadyevitch laid his hand affectionately on the secretary's arm. "'No, do as I asked you to,' said he, tempering his remark with a smile, and— Having briefly given his own explanation of the matter, he pushed away the papers and said, "'Do it so, I beg of you, Zakhar Nikitich.' The secretary went off confused. Levin, during this scene with the secretary, had entirely recovered from his embarrassment, and was standing with both arms resting on a chair. On his face was an ironical expression. "'I don't understand. I don't understand,' said he. "'What don't you understand?' asked Oblonsky, smiling and taking out a cigarette. He was expecting some sort of strange outbreak from Levin. "'I don't understand what you are up to,' said Levin, shrugging his shoulders. "'How can you do this sort of thing seriously?' "'Why not?' "'Why, because it is doing nothing.' "'You think so? We are overwhelmed with work.' "'On paper? Well, yes, you have a special gift for such things,' added Levin. "'You mean that I—' There is something that I lack. Perhaps so, yes. However, I cannot help admiring your high and mighty ways, and rejoicing that I have for a friend a man of such importance. But you did not answer my question, he asked, making a desperate effort to look Oblonsky full in the face. Now that's very good, very good. Go ahead, and you will succeed. Tis well that you have eight thousand acres of land in the district of Karadzinsk such muscles, and the complexion of a little girl of twelve. 
but you will catch up with us all the same. Yes, as to what you asked me, there is no change, but I am sorry that it has been so long since you were in town. Why? asked Levin in alarm. Well, it's nothing, replied Oblonsky. We will talk things over. What has brought you now, especially? Ah, we will speak also of that by and by, said Levin, again reddening to his very ears. Very good. I understand you, said Stefan Arkadyevitch. You see, I should have taken you home with me to dinner, but my wife is not well today. If you want to see them, you will find them at the zoological gardens from four to five. Kitty is skating. You go there. I will join you later, and we will get dinner somewhere together. Excellent. Das Vidanya. Look here. You see, I do know you. You will forget all about it, or will be suddenly starting back to your home in the country, cried Stefan Arkadyevitch with a laugh. No, truly I won't. Levin left the room, and only when he had passed the door realized that he had forgotten to salute Oblonsky's colleagues. That must be a gentleman of great energy, said Grenovitch, after Levin had taken his departure. Yes, Batyushka, said Stefan Arkadyevitch, throwing his head back. He is a likely fellow. Eight thousand acres in the Karzinsky district. He has a future before him, and how vigorous he is. He is not like the rest of us. What have you to complain about, Stefan Arkadyevitch? Well, things are bad. Bad, replied Stefan Arkadyevitch, sighing heavily. End of chapter 5《Part One, Chapter Six of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne Spiegel. When Oblonsky asked Levin for what special reason he had come, Levin grew red in the face, and he was angry with himself because he grew red. But how could he have replied, "I have come to ask the hand of your sister-in-law"? Yet he had come for that single purpose. The Levin and the Shcherbatsky families, belonging to the old nobility of Moscow, had always been on intimate and friendly terms. During Levin's student life the bond had grown stronger. He and the young Prince Shcherbatsky, the brother of Dolly and Kitty, had taken their preparatory studies and gone through the university together. At that time Levin was a frequent visitor at the Shcherbatskys and was in love with the house. Strange as it may seem, he was in love with the house itself with the family, especially with the feminine portion. Konstantin Levin could not remember his mother, and his only sister was much older than he was, so that for the first time he found in the house of the Sherbatskys that charming and cultivated life so peculiar to the old nobility, and of which the death of his parents had deprived him. All the members of this family, but especially the ladies, seemed to him to be surrounded with a mysterious and poetic halo. Not only did he fail to discover any faults in them, but underneath this poetic and mysterious halo surrounding them, he saw the loftiest sentiments and the most ideal perfections. Why these three young ladies were obliged to speak French and English every day, why they had to take turns in playing for hours at a time on the piano, the sounds of which floated up to their brother's room, where the young students were at work, why professors of French literature, of music, of drawing, of dancing, had come to give them lessons. Why the three young ladies, at a certain hour, accompanied by Mademoiselle Lignon, drove out in their carriage to the Tverskoya Boulevard, wearing satin shubkas, Dolly's very long, Natalie's of half-length, and Kitty's very short, showing her shapely ankles and close-fitting red stockings. And why, when they went to the Tverskoya Boulevard, they had to be accompanied by a lackey with a gilt cockade on his hat. All these things, and many others, were absolutely incomprehensible to him. But he felt that all that took place in this mysterious sphere was beautiful, and he was in love especially with this mystery of accomplishment. While he was a student, he almost fell in love with Dolly, the eldest, but she soon married Oblonsky. Then he began to be in love with the second, it was as if he felt it to be a necessity to love one of the three, only he could not decide which one he liked the best. But Natalie entered society, and soon married the diplomat, Lvov. Kitty was only a child when Levin left the university. 
young Sherbatsky joined the fleet and was drowned in the Baltic, and Levin's relations with the family became more distant, in spite of his friendship with Oblonsky. At the beginning of the winter, however, after a year's absence in the country, he had met the Sherbatskys again, and learned for the first time which of the three he was destined really to love. It would seem as if there could be nothing simpler for a young man of thirty-two, of good family, possessed of a fair fortune, and likely to be regarded as an eligible suitor, than to ask the young princess Sherbatskaya in marriage, and probably Levin would have been accepted as an excellent match. But he was in love, and consequently it seemed to him Kitty was a creature so accomplished, her superiority was so above everything earthly, and he himself was such an earthly insignificant being, that he was unwilling to admit, even in thought, that others, or Kitty herself, would regard him as worthy of her. Having spent two months in Moscow, as in a dream, meeting Kitty almost every day in society, which he allowed himself to frequent on account of her, he suddenly concluded that this alliance was impossible, and took his departure for the country. Levin's conclusion that it was impossible was reached by reasoning that in her parents' eyes he was not a suitor sufficiently advantageous or suitable for the beautiful Kitty, and that Kitty herself could not love him. In her parents' eyes he was engaged in no definite line of activity, and at his age had no position in the world, while his comrades were colonels or staff officers, distinguished professors, bank directors, railway officials, presidents of tribunals like Blonsky. But he, and he knew very well how he was regarded by his friends, was only a pomieszczyk, or country proprietor, busy with breeding of cows, hunting woodcock, and building farmhouses. In other words, he was an incapable youth who had accomplished nothing, and who, in the eyes of society, was doing just what men do who have made a failure. Surely, the mysterious, charming Kitty could not love a man so ill-favored, dull, and good-for-nothing as he felt that he was. Moreover, his former relations with her, consequent upon his friendship with her brother, were those of a grown man with a child, and seemed to him only an additional obstacle to love. It was possible, he thought, for a girl to have a friendship for a good, homely man, such as he considered himself to be. But if he is to be loved with a love such as he felt for Kitty, he must be good-looking, and above all, a man of distinction. He had heard that women often fall in love with ill-favored, stupid men, but he did not believe that such would be his own experience, just as he felt that it would be impossible for him to love a woman who was not beautiful, brilliant, and poetic. But, having spent two months in the solitude of the country, he became convinced that this was not one of his youthful passions, that the state of his feelings allowed him not a moment of rest, and that he could not live without settling this mighty question, whether she would or would not be his wife, that his despair arose wholly from his imagination, and that he had no absolute certainty that she would refuse him. He had now returned to Moscow with the firm intention of offering himself, and of marrying her if she would accept him. If not, he could not think what would become of him. End of chapter 6 Part 1, Chapter 7 of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne Spiegel Levin had stopped at the house of his half-brother, Kosnuyshev. After making his toilet, he went to the library with the intention of telling him why he had come, and asking his advice, but his brother was not alone. He was talking with a famous professor of philosophy who had come up from Kharkov especially to settle a vexed question which had arisen between them on some very important philosophical subject. The professor was waging a bitter war on materialists, and Sergei Kosnuyshev followed his argument with interest, and, having read the professor's latest article, he had written him a letter expressing some objections. He blamed the professor for having made too large concessions on the materialists, and the professor had come on purpose to explain what he meant. The conversation turned on the question then fashionable. Is there a dividing line between the physical and the physiological phenomena of man's actions, and where is it to be found? 
Sergey Ivanovitch welcomed his brother with the same coldly benevolent smile which he bestowed on all, and, after introducing him to the professor, continued the discussion. The professor, a small man with spectacles and narrow forehead, stopped long enough to return Levin's bow, and then continued without noticing him further. Levin sat down to wait till the professor should go, but soon began to feel interested in the discussion. He had read in the reviews articles on this subject, but he had read them with only that general interest which a man who has studied the natural sciences at the university is likely to take in their development. But he had never appreciated the connection that exists between these learned questions of the origin of man, of reflex action, of biology, of sociology, and those touching the significance of life and death for himself, which had of late been more and more engaging his attention. As he listened to the discussion between his brother and the professor, he noticed that they agreed to a certain kinship between scientific and psychological questions, that several times they almost took up this subject, but each time that they came near what seemed to him the most important question of all, they instantly took pains to avoid it, and sought refuge in the domain of subtle distinctions, explanations, citations, references to authorities, and he found it hard to understand what they were talking about. "'I cannot accept the theory of Christ,' said Sergey Ivanovitch, in his characteristically elegant and correct diction and expression, "'and I cannot at all admit that my whole conception of the exterior world is derived from my sensations.' The most fundamental concept of being does not arise from the senses, nor is there any special organ by which this conception is produced. Yes, but Wurst and Naust and Pripasov will reply that your consciousness of existence is derived from an accumulation of all sensations, that it is only the result of sensations. Wurst himself says explicitly that where sensation does not exist, there is no consciousness of existence. I will say, on the other hand, began Sergey Ivanovitch, but here Levin noticed that, just as they were about to touch the root of the whole matter, they again steered clear of it, and he determined to put the following question to the professor. Suppose my sensation ceased, if my body were dead, would further existence be possible? The professor, with some vexation, and, as it were, intellectual anger at this interruption, looked at the strange questioner, as if he took him for a clown rather than a philosopher, and turned his eyes to Sergey Ivanovitch, as if to ask, "'What does this man mean?' But Sergey Ivanovitch, who was not nearly so one-sided and zealous a partisan as the professor, and who had sufficient health of mind both to answer the professor and to see the simple and natural point of view from which the question was asked, smiled and said, "'We have not yet gained the right to answer that question.' "'Our capacities are not sufficient,' continued the professor, taking up the thread of his argument. "'No, I insist upon this, that if, as Pripasov says plainly, sensations are based upon impressions, we cannot too closely distinguish between the two notions.' Levin did not listen any longer, and waited until the professor took his departure. End of chapter 7「Part One, Chapter Eight of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne Spiegel. When the professor was gone, Sergey Ivanovitch turned to his brother. "I am very glad to see you. Shall you stay long? How are things on the estate?" Levin knew that his elder brother took little interest in the affairs of the estate and only asked out of courtesy and so in reply he merely spoke of the sale of wheat, and the money he had received. It had been his intention to speak with his brother about his marriage project, and to ask his advice, but after the conversation with the professor, and in consequence of the involuntarily patronizing tone in which his brother had asked him about their affairs, for their real estate had never been divided and Levin managed it as a whole, he felt that he could not begin to talk about his project of marriage. He had an instinctive feeling that his brother would not look upon it as he should wish him to. "'How is it with the Zemsvo?' asked Sergey Ivanovitch, who took a lively interest in these provincial assemblies, to which he attributed great importance. "'The fact is, I don't know.' "'What? 
Aren't you a member of the assembly? No, I am no longer a member. I have not been going, and don't intend to go any more, said Levin. It's too bad, murmured Sergey Ivanovitch, frowning. Levin, in justification, described what had taken place at the meetings of his district assembly. But it is forever thus, exclaimed Sergey Ivanovitch, interrupting. We Russians are always like this. Possibly it is one of our good traits that we are willing to see our faults, but we exaggerate them. We take delight in irony, which comes natural to our language. If such rights as we have, if our provincial institutions were given to any other people in Europe, Germans or English, I tell you, they would derive liberty from them, but we only turn them into sport. But what is to be done? asked Levin, penitently. It was my last attempt. I tried with all my heart. I cannot do it. I am helpless. Not helpless, said Sergey Ivanovitch. You did not look at the matter in the right light. Perhaps not, replied Levin in a melancholy tone. Do you know Brother Nikolai has been in town again? Nikolai was Konstantin Levin's own brother, and Sergey Ivanovitch's half-brother, standing between them in age. He was a ruined man, who had wasted the larger part of his fortune, had mingled with the strangest and most disgraceful society, and had quarrelled with his brothers. "'What did you say?' cried Levin, startled. "'How did you know?' Prokofy saw him in the street. "'Here, in Moscow. Where is he?' And Levin stood up as if with the intention of instantly going to find him. "'I am sorry that I told you this,' said Sergey Ivanovitch, shaking his head when he saw his younger brother's emotion. "'I sent out to find where he was staying, and I sent him his letter of credit and Trubin, the amount of which I paid. This is what he wrote me in reply.' And Sergey Ivanovitch handed his brother a note which he took from a letter-press. Levin read the letter, which was written in the strange hand which he knew so well. I humbly beg to be left in peace. It is all that I ask from my dear brothers. Nikolai Levin. Constantine, without lifting his head, stood motionless before his brother with the letter in his hand. The desire arose in his heart now to forget his unfortunate brother, and the consciousness that it would be wrong. He evidently wants to insult me, continued Sergey Ivanovitch, but it is impossible. I wish with all my soul that I might help him, and yet I know that I shall not succeed. Yes, yes, replied Levin, I understand, and I appreciate your treatment of him, but I am going to him. Go, by all means, if it will give you pleasure, said Sergey Ivanovitch, but I would not advise it, not on my account, because I fear that he might make a quarrel between us, but, on your own account, I advise you not to go. He can't be helped. However, do as you think best." Perhaps he can't be helped, but I feel especially at this moment. This is quite another reason. I feel that I could not be contented. Well, I don't understand you, said Sergey Ivanovitch. But one thing I do understand, he added. This is a lesson in humility. Since Brother Nikolai has become the man he is, I look with greater indulgence on what people call abjectness. Do you know what he has done? Ugh, oh, it is terrible, terrible, replied Levin. Having obtained from his brother's servant Nikolai's address, Levin set out to find him, but on second thought changed his mind, and postponed his visit till evening. Before all, he must decide the question that had brought him to Moscow, in order that his mind might be free. He had therefore gone directly to Oblonsky, and having learned where he could find the Sherbatskys, he went where he was told that he would meet Kitty. End of chapter 8 Part One, Chapter Nine of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne Spiegel. About four o'clock, Levin dismissed his Zvashchik at the entrance of the zoological garden, and with beating heart followed the path that led to the ice mountains and the skating pond, for he knew that he should find Kitty there, having seen the Sherbatsky's carriage at the gate. It was a clear, frosty day. At the entrance of the garden were drawn up rows of carriages and sleighs. Hired drivers and policemen stood on the watch. Hosts of fashionable people, with their hats gaily glancing in the bright sunlight, were gathered around the doors and on the paths cleared of snow. 
among the pretty Russian cottages with their carved balconies. The ancient birch trees of the garden, their thick branches all laden with snow, seemed clothed in new and solemn cassables. Levin followed the footpath, saying to himself, Be calm. There is no reason for being agitated. What do you desire? What ails you? Be quiet, you fool. Thus Levin addressed his heart, and the more he endeavored to calm his agitation, the more he was overcome by it, till at last he could hardly breathe. An acquaintance spoke to him as he passed, but Levin did not even notice who it was. He drew near the ice mountains, on which creaked the ropes that let down the sledges and drew them up again. The sleds flew with a rush down the slopes, and there was a tumult of happy voices. He went a few steps farther, and before him spread the skating ground, and among the skaters he soon discovered her. He knew that he was near her from the joy and terror that seized his heart. She was standing at the opposite end of the pond, engaged in conversation with a lady, and nothing either in her toilet or in her position was remarkable, but for Levin she stood out from the rest like a rose-bush among nettles. Everything was made radiant by her. She was the smile that lightened the whole place. "'Do I dare go and meet her on the ice?' he asked himself. The place where she was seemed like an unapproachable sanctuary, and for a moment he almost turned to go away again, so full of awe it was. He had to master himself by a supreme effort to think that, as she was surrounded by people of every sort, he had as much right as the rest to go on there and skate. So he went down on the ice, not letting himself look long at her, as if she were the sun. But he saw her, as he saw the sun, even though he did not look at her. On this day, and at this hour, the ice formed a common meeting-ground for people of one clique, all of whom were well acquainted. There were also masters in the art of skating, who came to show off their skill. Others were learning to skate by holding on chairs, and making awkward and distressing gestures. There were young ladies, and old men, who skated as a gymnastic exercise. All seemed to Levin to be the happy children of fortune, because they were near Kitty. And all these skaters, with apparently perfect unconcern, glided around her, came close to her, even spoke to her, and with absolute indifference to her enjoyed themselves, making the most of the good skating and splendid weather. Nikolai Sherbatsky, Kitty's cousin, in short jacket and knickerbockers, was seated on a bench with his skates on, and seeing Levin, he cried, "'Ah, the best skater in Russia! Have you been here long? The ice is first-rate. Put on your skates, quick!' "'I have not my skates with me,' replied Levin, surprised at this freedom and audacity in her presence, and not losing her out of his sight a single instant, although he did not look at her. He felt that the sun was shining near to him. She was at one corner and came gliding toward him, putting together her slender feet in high boots, and evidently feeling a little timid. A boy in Russian costume was clumsily trying to get ahead of her, desperately waving his arms and bending far forward. Kitty herself did not skate with much confidence. She had taken her hands out of her little muff, suspended by a ribbon, and held them together to grasp the first object that came in her way. Looking at Levin, whom she had recognized, she smiled at him and at her own timidity. As soon as this evolution was finished, she struck out with her elastic little foot and skated up to Sherbatsky, seizing him by the arm, and gave Levin a friendly welcome. She was more charming even than he had imagined her to be. Whenever he thought of her, he could easily recall her whole appearance, but especially the charm of her small blonde head, set so gracefully on her pretty shoulders, and her expression of childlike frankness and goodness. The combination of childlike grace and delicate beauty of form was her special charm, and Levin thoroughly appreciated it. But what struck him like something always new and unexpected was the look in her sweet eyes, her calm and sincere face, and her smile, which transported him to a world of enchantment, where he felt at peace and at rest, as he remembered occasionally feeling in the days of his early childhood. "'Have you been here long?' she asked, giving him her hand. "'Thank you,' she added, as he picked up her handkerchief, which had dropped out of her muff. "'I? No, n not long. I came yesterday.' "'That is, today,' answered Levin, so agitated that at first he did not get the drift of her question.' 
I wanted to call upon you, said he, and when he remembered what his errand was, he grew red, and was more distressed than ever. I did not know that you skated, and so well. She looked at him closely, as if trying to divine the reason of his embarrassment. Your praise is precious. A tradition that you are the best of skaters is still floating about, said she, brushing off with her little hand, in its black glove, the pine needles that had fallen on her muff. Yes, I used to be passionately fond of skating. I had the ambition to reach perfection. It seems to me that you do all things passionately, said she with a smile. I should like to see you skate. Put on your skates, and we will skate together. Skate together, he thought, as he looked at her. Is it possible? I will go and put them right on, he said, and he hastened to find a pair of skates. It is a long time, sir, since you have been with us, said the Katoshik, as he lifted his foot to fit the heel to it. Since your day we have not had any one who deserved to be called a master in the art. Are they going to suit you? he asked, as he tightened the strap. Excellent, excellent, only please make haste, said Levin, unable to hide the smile of joy which, in spite of him, irradiated his face. Yes, he said to himself, this is life, this is happiness. We will skate together, she said. Shall I speak to her now? But I am afraid to speak, because I am happy, happy only in the hope. Yet when? But it must be, it must, it must. Down with weakness. Levin stood up, took off his cloak, and, after making his way across the rough ice around the little house, he skated out on the glare surface without effort, hastening, shortening, and directing his pace as if by the mere effort of his will. He felt timid about coming up to her, but again her smile assured him. She gave him her hand, and they skated side by side, gradually increasing speed, and the faster they went, the closer she held his hand. "'I shall learn very quickly with you,' she said. "'Somehow I feel confidence in you.' "'I am confident myself when you cling to my hand,' he answered, and immediately he was startled at what he had said, and grew red in the face. In fact, he had scarcely uttered the words when, just as the sun goes under a cloud, her face lost all its kindness, and Levin became aware of the well-remembered play of her face indicating the force of her thoughts. A slight frown wrinkled her smooth brow. "'Has anything disagreeable happened to you? But I have no right to ask,' he added quickly. "'Why so? No, nothing disagreeable has happened to me.' she said coolly, and immediately continued. "'Have you seen Mademoiselle Lignon yet?' "'Not yet. Go and see her. She is so fond of you.' "'What does this mean? I have offended her. Lord, have pity on me,' thought Levin, and skated swiftly towards the old French governess, with little grey curls, who was watching them from a bench. She received him like an old friend, smiling and showing her false teeth. "'Yes, but how we have grown up! she said, indicating Kitty with her eyes, and how demure we are. Tiny Bear has grown large, continued the old governess, still smiling, and she recalled his jest about the three young ladies whom he had named after the three bears in the English story. Do you remember that you used to call them so? He had entirely forgotten it, but she had laughed at this pleasantry for ten years and still enjoyed it. Now, go, go and skate. Doesn't our Kitty take to it beautifully? When Levin rejoined Kitty, her face was no longer severe. Her eyes had regained their frank and kindly expression, but it seemed to him that her very kindliness had a peculiar premeditated tone of serenity, and he felt troubled. After speaking of the old governess and her eccentricities, she asked him about his own life. "'Isn't it a bore living in the country in the winter?' she asked. "'No, it is not a bore. I am very busy,' he replied." conscious that she was bringing him into the atmosphere of serene friendliness from which he could not escape now any more than he could at the beginning of the winter. "'Shall you stay long?' asked Kitty. "'I do not know,' he answered, without regard to what he was saying. The thought that, if he fell back into that tone of calm friendship, he might return home without reaching any decision, occurred to him, and he resolved to rebel against it. "'Why don't you know?' "'I don't know why. It depends on you.' he said, and instantly he was horrified at his own words. She either did not understand his words, or did not want to understand them, for, seeming to stumble once or twice, catching her foot, she hurriedly skated away from him, and, having spoken to Mademoiselle Lignon, she went to the little house where her skates were removed by the waiting-women. 
Oh, God, what have I done? Oh, Lord God, have pity on me, and come to my aid, was Levin's secret prayer. And, feeling the need of taking some violent exercise, he began to describe outer and inner curves on the ice. At this instant a young man, the best among the recent skaters, came out of the café with his skates on and a cigarette in his mouth. With one spring he slid down, slipping and leaping from step to step, and, without even changing the easy position of his arms, skated down and out upon the ice. "'Ah, that is a new trick,' said Levin to himself, and he climbed up to the top of the bank to try the new trick. "'Don't kill yourself. It needs practice,' shouted Nikolai Sherbatsky. Levin went up on the platform, got as good a start as he could, and then flew down the steps, preserving his balance with his arms, but at the last step he stumbled, made a violent effort to recover himself, regained his equilibrium, and, with a laugh, glided out upon the ice. "'Charming, glorious fellow,' thought Kitty, at this moment coming out of the little house with Mademoiselle Lignon, and looking at him with a gentle, affectionate smile, as if he were a beloved brother. "'Is it my fault? Have I done anything very bad? People say coquetry. I know that I don't love him, but it is pleasant to be with him.' and he is such a splendid fellow. But what made him say that? Seeing Kitty departing with her mother, who had come for her, Levin, flushed with his violent exercise, stopped and pondered. Then he took off his skates and joined the mother and daughter at the gate. "'Very glad to see you,' said the princess. "'We receive on Thursdays, as usual.' "'Today, then. We shall be very glad to see you,' she answered coolly. This coolness troubled Kitty, and she could not restrain her desire to temper her mother's chilling manner. She turned her head and said with a smile, "'We shall see you, I hope.' At this moment Stefan Arkadyevitch, with hat on one side, with animated face and bright eyes, entered the garden. But as he came up to his wife's mother, he assumed a melancholy and humiliated expression, and replied to the questions which she asked about Dolly's health. When he had finished speaking in a low and broken voice with his mother-in-law, he straightened himself up and took Levin's arm. "'Now, then, shall we go? I have been thinking of you all the time, and I am very glad that you came,' he said, with a significant look into his eyes. "'Come on, come on,' replied the happy Levin, who did not cease to hear the sound of a voice, saying, "'We shall see you, I hope,' or to recall the smile that accompanied the words. "'At the Angela or at the Hermitage?' "'It's all the same to me.' "'At the Angela, then,' said Stefan Arkadyevitch, making this choice because he owed more there than at the Hermitage, and it seemed unworthy of him, so to speak, to avoid this restaurant. "'You have an Izvoshchik? So much the better, for I sent off my carriage.' While they were on the way, the friends did not exchange a word. Levin was pondering on the meaning of the change in the expression of Kitty's face, and at one moment persuaded himself that there was hope— and at the next plunged into despair, and he saw clearly that his hope was unreasonable. Nevertheless, he felt that he was another man since he had heard those words, We shall see you, I hope, and seen her smile. Stefan Arkadyevitch was in the meantime making out the menu for their dinner. You like turpot, don't you? were his first words on entering the restaurant. What? exclaimed Levin. Turbot. Yes, I am excessively fond of turbot. End of chapter 9
as from some horrid place. His whole soul was filled with memories of Kitty, and his eyes shone with triumph and happiness. "'This way, Your Excellency. Come this way, and Your Excellency will not be disturbed,' said a specially obsequious old tartar, whose monstrous hips made the tails of his coat stick out behind. "'Will you come this way, Your Excellency?' he said to Levin, as a sign of respect for Stepan Arkadyevitch, whose guest he was. In a twinkling he had spread a fresh cloth on the round table, which, already covered, stood under the bronze chandelier. Then, bringing two velvet chairs, he stood waiting for Stepan Arkadyevitch's orders, holding in one hand his napkin and his order-card in the other. "'If Your Excellency would like to have a private room, one will be at your service in a few moments. Prince Galitsian and a lady. We have just received fresh oysters.' "'Ah, oysters!' Stefan Arkadyevitch reflected. "'Supposing we change our plan, Levin,' said he, with his finger on the bill of fare. His face showed serious hesitation. "'But are the oysters good? Pay attention.' "'They are from Flensburg, Your Excellency. There are none from Ostend. Flensburg oysters are well enough. But are they fresh? They came yesterday. Very good. What do you say? To begin with oysters, and then make a complete change in our menu—' What say you? It's all the same to me. I'd like best of all some shki and kashka, but you can't get them here. Kasha a la russa, if you would like to order it, said the tartar, bending over toward Levin as a nurse bends toward a child. No, jesting aside, whatever you wish is good. I've been skating and should like something to eat. Don't imagine, he added, as he saw an expression of disappointment on Oblonsky's face, that I do not appreciate your selection. I can eat a good dinner with pleasure. It should be more than that. You should say that it is one of the pleasures of life, said Stepan Arkadyevitch. In this case, little brother mine, give us two, or— No, that's not enough. A three dozen oysters, vegetable soup. Printanière, suggested the tartar. But Stepan Arkadyevitch did not allow him the pleasure of enumerating the dishes in French, and continued, Vegetable soup, you understand. Then turbot with thick sauce— then roast beef, but see to it that it's all right. Yes, some capon, and lastly, some preserve. The tartar, remembering Stefan Arkadyevitch's caprice of not calling the dishes by their French names, instead of repeating them after him, waited till he had finished, then gave himself the pleasure of repeating the order according to the bill of fare. Potage printanier, to beau, sauce boumarché, pollard à l'estron, macédoine de froc, then instantly, as if moved by a spring, he substituted for the bill of fare the wine list, which he presented to Stepan Arkadyevitch. What shall we drink? Whatever you please, only not much. Champagne, suggested Levin. What? At the very beginning? But you may be right. Why not? Do you like the white seal? Cachet blanc, replied the tartar. Well, then, give us that brand with the oysters. Then we'll see. It shall be done, sir. And what table wine shall I bring you? Some nuits. No, hold on. Give us some classic chablis. It shall be done, sir. And will you order some of your cheese? Yes, some parmesan. Or do you prefer some other kind? No, it's all the same to me, replied Levin, who could not keep from smiling. The tartar disappeared on the trot, with his coat-tails flying out behind him. Five minutes later he came with a platter of oysters opened and on the shell, and with a bottle in his hand. Stefan Arkadyevitch crumpled up his well-starched napkin, tucked it into his waistcoat, calmly stretched out his hands, and began to attack the oysters. "'Not bad at all,' he said, as he lifted the succulent oysters from their shells with a silver fork, and swallowed them one by one. "'Not bad at all,' he repeated, looking from Levin to the tartar, his eyes gleaming with satisfaction. Levin also ate his oysters— although he would have preferred white bread and cheese. But he could not help admiring Oblonsky. Even the tartar, after uncorking the bottle and pouring the sparkling wine into wide, delicate glass cups, looked at Stefan Arkadyevitch with a noticeable smile of satisfaction, while he adjusted his white necktie. "'You are not very fond of oysters, are you?' asked Stefan Arkadyevitch, draining his glass. "'Or are you preoccupied? Hey?' He wanted Levin to be in good spirits, but Levin was anxious, if he was not downcast. His heart being so full, he found himself out of his element in this restaurant, 
amid the confusion of guests coming and going, surrounded by the private rooms where men and women were dining together, everything was repugnant to his feelings, the whole outfit of bronzes and mirrors, the gas and the tartars, he felt that the sentiment that occupied his soul would be defiled. I, yes, I am a little absent-minded, but besides, everything here confuses me. You can't imagine, he said, how strange all these surroundings seem to a countryman like myself. It's like the fingernails of that gentleman whom I met at your office. Yes, I noticed that poor Grinovich's fingernails interested you greatly, said Stepan Arkadyevitch, laughing. It is of no use, said Levin. Suppose you come to me and try the standpoint of a man accustomed to living in the country. We in the country try to have hands suitable to work with, therefore we cut off our fingernails, and oftentimes we even turn back our sleeves. But here men let their nails grow as long as possible, and so as to be sure of not being able to do any work with their hands, they fasten their sleeves with plates for buttons. Stepan Arkadyevitch smiled gaily. That is a sign that he has no need of manual labor. It is brain work. Perhaps so. Yet it seems strange to me. No less than this that we are doing here. In the country we make haste to get through our meals so as to be at work again. But here you and I are doing our best to eat as long as possible, without getting satisfied, and so we are eating oysters. Well, there's something in that, replied Stepan Arkadyevitch. But the aim of civilization is to translate everything into enjoyment. If that is its aim, I should prefer to be untamed. And you are untamed. All you Levins are untamed. Levin sighed. He thought of his brother Nikolai, and felt mortified and saddened, and his face grew dark. But Oblonsky introduced a topic which had the immediate effect of diverging him. Very well. Come this evening to our house. I mean to the Sherbatskys, said he, pushing away the empty oyster shells, drawing the cheese toward him, and flashing his eyes significantly. "'Yes, I will surely come,' replied Levin, though it did not seem that the princess was very cordial in her invitation. "'What rubbish! It was only her manner. Come, friend, bring us the soup.' "'It was only in her grand dame manner,' replied Stepan Arkadyevitch. "'I shall come there immediately after a rehearsal at the Countess Bonina's. How can we help calling you untamed? How can you explain your flight from Moscow? The Sherbatskys have kept asking me about you, as if I were likely to know.' I only know one thing, that you are always likely to do things that no one else did. Yes, replied Levin slowly and with emotion. You are right. I am untamed. Yet it was not that I went, but that I have come back proves me so. I have come now. Oh, what a lucky fellow you are, interrupted Oblonsky, looking into Levin's eyes. Why? I know fiery horses by their brand, and I know young people who are in love by their eyes, said Stepan Arkadyevitch, dramatically. Everything is before you. And yourself? Is everything behind you? No, not altogether, but you have the future, and I have the present, and this present is between the devil and the deep sea. What is the matter? Nothing good, but I don't want to talk about myself, especially as I cannot explain the circumstances replied Stepan Arkadyevitch. "'What did you come to Moscow for? Here, clear off the things,' he cried to the Tartar. "'Can't you imagine?' asked Levin, not taking his glowing eyes from Oblonsky's face. "'I can imagine, but it is not for me to be the first to speak about it. By this you can tell whether I am right in my conjecture,' said Stepan Arkadyevitch, looking at Levin with a sly smile. "'Well, what have you to tell me?' asked Levin, with a trembling voice and feeling all the muscles of his face quiver. How do you look at this? Stepan Arkadyevitch slowly drank his glass of Chablis while he looked steadily at Levin. I, said Stepan Arkadyevitch, there is nothing that I should like so much. Nothing. It is the best thing that could possibly be. But aren't you mistaken? Do you know what we were talking about? murmured Levin, with his eyes fixed on his companion. Do you believe that it is possible? I think it is possible. Why shouldn't it be? No. Do you really think that it is possible? No. Tell me what you really think. If... If she should refuse me, and I am almost certain that... Why should you be? asked Stepan Arkadyevitch, smiling at this emotion. It is my intuition. It would be terrible for me, and for her. Oh. In any case, I can't see that it would be very terrible for her, 
A young lady is always flattered to be asked in marriage. Young girls in general, perhaps, but not she. Stefan Arkadyevitch smiled. He perfectly understood Levin's feeling, knew that for him all the young girls in the universe were divided into two categories. In the one, all the young girls in existence except her, and these girls had all the faults common to humanity, in other words, ordinary girls. In the other, she alone, without any faults, and placed above the rest of humanity. Hold on, take some gravy, said he, stopping Levin's hand, who was pushing away the gravy. Levin took the gravy in all humility, but he did not give Oblonsky a chance to eat. No, just wait. Wait, said he. You understand that this is, for me, a question of life and death. I have never spoken to anyone else about it, and I cannot speak to anyone else but you. I know that we are very different from each other, have different tastes, views, everything. But I know also that you love me, and that you understand me, and that's the reason I am so fond of you. Now, for God's sake, be perfectly sincere with me. I will tell you what I think, said Stepan Arkadyevitch, smiling. But I will tell you more. My wife, a most extraordinary woman, and Stepan Arkadyevitch sighed as he remembered his relations with his wife. Then, after a moment's silence, he proceeded. She has a gift of second sight, and sees through people. But that is nothing. She knows what is going to happen, especially when there is a question of marriage. Thus she predicted that Brenton would marry Shakovskaya. No one would believe it, and yet it came to pass. Well, my wife is on your side. What do you mean? I mean that she likes you. She says that Kitty will be your wife. As he heard these words, Levin's face suddenly lighted up with a smile which was near to tears of emotion. She said that, he cried. I always said that your wife was charming. But enough. Enough of this sort of talk, he added, and rose from the table. Good. But sit a little while longer. But Levin could not sit down. He strode two or three times up and down the little square room, winking his eyes to hide the tears, and then he sat down again at the table. Understand me, he said. This is not love. I have been in love. But this is not the same thing. This is more than a sentiment. It is an inward power that controls me. You see, I went away because I had made up my mind that such happiness could not exist, that such good fortune could not be on earth. But after a struggle with myself, I find that I cannot live without this. This question must be decided. But why did you go away? Ah, oh, wait. Ah, oh, so many things to think about, so much to ask. Listen, you cannot imagine what your words have done for me. I am so happy that I have already grown detestable. I am forgetting everything. And yet this very day I heard that my brother Nikolai, you know, he is here, and I had entirely forgotten him. It seems to me that he, too, ought to be happy. But this is like a fit of madness. But one thing seems terrible to me. You are married. You ought to know this feeling. It is terrible that when we are already getting old, with a past behind us, not of love but of wickedness, suddenly come into close relations with a pure and innocent being, this is disgusting, and so I cannot help feeling that I am unworthy. Well, you have not much wickedness to answer for. Ugh, oh, said Levin, and yet, as I look with disgust on my life, I tremble and curse and mourn bitterly. Yes. But what can you do? The world is thus constituted, said Stefan Arkadyevitch. There is only one consolation, and this is in the prayer that I have always loved. Pardon me not according to my deserts, but according to thy loving kindness. Thus only she can forgive me. End of chapter 10 Part 1, Chapter 11 of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Nathan Haskell Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne Spiegel. Levin drained his glass, and they were silent. I ought to tell you one thing, though. Do you know Vronsky? asked Stefan Arkadyevitch. No, I don't know him. Why do you ask? Bring us another bottle said Oblonsky to the Tartar, who was refilling their glasses and was hovering about them, especially when he was not needed. You must know that Vronsky is one of your rivals. Who is this Vronsky? asked Levin, 
and his face, a moment since beaming with the youthful enthusiasm which Oblonsky so much admired, suddenly took on a disagreeable expression of anger. Vronsky, he is one of Count Kirill Ivanovitch Vronsky's sons, and one of the finest examples of the gilded youth of Petersburg. I used to know him at Tver when I was on duty there. He came there for recruiting service. He is immensely rich, handsome, with excellent connections, one of the Emperor's aides, and, moreover, a capital good fellow. From what I have seen of him, he is more than a good fellow. He is well educated and bright. He is a rising man. Levin scowled and said nothing. Well, then, he put in an appearance soon after you left, and, as I understand, he fell over ears in love with Kitty. You understand that her mother— Excuse me, but I don't understand at all, interrupted Levin, scowling still more fiercely. And suddenly he remembered his brother Nikolai, and how ugly it was in him to forget him. Just wait, wait said Stepan Arkadyevitch, laying his hand on Levin's arm with a smile. I have told you all I know, but I repeat that, in my humble opinion, the chances in this delicate affair are on your side. Levin leaned back in his chair. His face was pale. But I advise you to settle the matter as quickly as possible, suggested Oblonsky, filling up his glass. No, thank you. I cannot drink any more, said Levin, pushing away the glass. I shall be tipsy. Well, how are you feeling? He added, desiring to change the conversation. One word more. In any case, I advise you to settle the question quickly. I advise you to speak immediately, said Stepan Arkadyevitch. Go tomorrow morning. Make your proposal in classic style, and God bless you. Why haven't you ever come to hunt with me as you promised to do? Come this spring, said Levin. He now repented with all his heart that he had entered upon this conversation with Stepan Arkadyevitch. His deepest feelings were wounded by what he had just learned of all the pretensions of his rival, the young officer from Petersburg, as well as by the advice and insinuations of Stepan Arkadyevitch. Stepan Arkadyevitch smiled. He perceived what was taking place in Levin's heart. "'I will come some day,' he said. "'Yes, brother. Woman's the spring that moves everything.' My own trouble is bad, very bad, and all on account of women. Give me your advice, he said, taking a cigar, and still holding his glass in his hand. Tell me frankly what you think. But about what? Listen, suppose you were married, that you loved your wife, but had been drawn away by another woman. Excuse me, I really can't imagine any such thing, as it looks to me. It would be as if in coming out from dinner I should steal a loaf of bread from a bakery. Stepan Arkadyevitch's eyes sparkled more than usual. Why not? Bread sometimes smells so good that one cannot resist the temptation. Himmlisch ist, wenn ich besungen meine irdische Begier, aber doch wenn's nicht gelungen, hat ich auch recht hübsch Plaisir. It was heaven when I gained what my heart desired on earth. Yet, if not all were attained, still I had my share of mirth. As he repeated these lines, Oblonsky smiled. Levin could not refrain from smiling also. But a truce to pleasantries, continued Oblonsky. Imagine a woman, a charming, modest, loving creature, poor and alone in the world, who had sacrificed everything for you. Now, imagine, after the thing is done, is it necessary to give her up? We'll allow that it is necessary to break with her, so as not to disturb the peace of the family. But ought we not to pity her, to make provision for her, to soften the blow? Pardon me, but you know that for me all women are divided into two classes. No, that is, there are women, and there are... But I never yet have seen or expect to see beautiful fallen women, beautiful repentant Magdalens, and such women as that painted French creature at the bar, with her false curls, fill me with disgust, and all fallen women are the same. But the women of the New Testament? Ugh! Hold your peace. Never would Christ have said those words if he had known to what bad use they would be put. Out of the whole gospel only those words are taken. However, I don't say what I think, 
but what I feel. You feel a disgust for spiders, and I for these reptiles. You see, you did not have to study spiders, and you know nothing about their natures. So it is with me. It is well for you to say so. It is a very convenient way to do as the character in Dickens did, and throw all embarrassing questions over his right shoulder with his left hand. But to deny a fact is not to answer it. Now, what is to be done? Tell me, what is to be done? Your wife grows old, and you are full of life. Before you are aware of it, you realize that you do not love your wife, however much you may respect her. And then, suddenly you fall in love with someone, and you fall. You fall, said Stefan Arkadyevitch, with a melancholy despair. Levin laughed. Yes, you fall, repeated Oblonsky. Then what is to be done? Don't steal fresh bread. Stefan Arkadyevitch burst out laughing. Oh, moralist! But please appreciate the situation. Here are two women. One insists only on her rights, and her rights mean your love which you cannot give. The other has sacrificed everything for you and demands nothing. What can one do? How can one proceed? Here is a terrible tragedy. If you wish my judgment concerning this tragedy, I will tell you that I don't believe in this tragedy, and this is why. In my opinion, love, the two loves which Plato describes in his symposium, you remember, serve as the touchstone for men. Some people understand only one of them. Others understand the other. Those who comprehend only the platonic love have no right to speak of this tragedy now. In this sort of love there can be no tragedy. I thank you humbly for the pleasure, and therein consists the whole drama. But for platonic love there can be no tragedy, because it is bright and pure, and because... At this moment Levin remembered his own shortcomings, and the inward struggles which he had undergone, and he unexpectedly added, However, you may be right. It is quite possible. I know nothing, absolutely nothing, about it. Do you see, said Stefan Arkadyevitch, you are a very perfect man. Your great virtue is your only fault. You are a very perfect character, and you desire that all the factors of life should also be perfect. But this cannot be. Here you scorn the service of the state, because, according to your idea, every action should correspond to an exact end. But this cannot be. You require also that the activity of every man should always have an object that conjugal life and love be one and the same. But this cannot be. All the variety, all the charm, all the beauty of life consists in lights and shades. Levin sighed and did not answer. He was absorbed in his own thoughts and did not even listen. And suddenly both of them felt that, though they were good friends, though they had been dining together and drinking wine, yet each was thinking only of his own affairs and cared nothing for the affairs of the other. Oblonsky had more than once had this experience after dining with a friend, and he knew what had to be done when, instead of coming into closer sympathy, the distance between them seemed widened. "'The account!' he cried, and went into the next room, where he met an aide whom he knew, and with whom he began to talk about an actress and her lover. This conversation amused and rested Oblonsky, after his conversation with Levin, who always kept his mind on too great an intellectual and moral strain. When the Tartar brought the account, accounting to twenty-six roubles and odd kopecks, and something more for his fee, Levin, who at any other time, as a countryman, would have been shocked at the size of the bill, paid the fourteen roubles of his share without noticing, and went to his lodgings to dress for a reception at the Shabatsky's, where his fate would be decided. End of chapter 11